Hey guys, just want to talk about uh, searching for the negativity and everything. You will come across it from time to time, and I mean, I've had somebody already this week say, oh, you, you opened a business in the Philippines because you couldn't afford it in the UK. I actually operate businesses in the UK. I've had my own furniture company in the UK. I've had my own restaurant in the UK. I also, even now, get consultancy for the UK. So the point being is, that's got nothing to do with it. Reality is, the UK is not about affordability, but viability. When we had the restaurant, um, my overheads were over 100 and, I think it was 108,000 pounds a year. That was for business raise and rent. And then the rest of it is basically the running costs. Uh, sorry, that was the business agent rent. The rest of it was on top of that, like the wages, electricity, etc. On top of that is a prime example of McDonald's in um, Palisades, Palisades, Birmingham. They had a wooden shed, literally a wooden shed on the roof, on the car park, that Palisades up the rent to £28,000 a year. McDonald's said, you know what, it's enough's enough, we're not paying it. So they cancelled that contract. And then the Palisades made it awkward for the McDonald's to do the deliveries and stuff because they are so obsessive on greed. That is a UK, 100% greed. What's in it for me? You look at the NHS and stuff, and I mean, this is why I'm not a fan of socialists, because of the manipulation. Because most socialists that I know are not socialists in the, in the benefit of all. They are socialists based on work should be a choice. Living on the back of you is what, is what they're after. That, for me, is not socialism. That's just parasitical. But that is the NHS. The NHS... You'll get people roll out the nurses, the doctors, saying, oh, we need more doctors, more nurses, they need more money, blah, blah, blah. On the back of that, there's a lot of money hidden. There's a lot of money hidden on things like housing allowances and things like that. And they'll go, this, their pay is this, but it's the minimum. And then they forget to add all the other bits. It's a bit like the, I think, the dustbin driver in uh, uh, Birmingham, where his wage was like this. They go, oh, it's 18, 20,000. But by the time he's actually had all these allowances and working over the bank collars and stuff, it's around 70,000. They lie. They always lie. Um, the same as you find in a lot of government services, with early retirement, um, ring fence pensions, inflation-related, etc., etc. Retiring before you do, you'll die because you're paying theirs. So you're more likely to die paying their pension as well as yours, while they are already enjoying Marbella or whatever. So, my personal view on it, the UK is parasitical with these government organisations. They're all just cash cows for themselves. And they lie a lot. I mean, when you get police retire early, fire retire early, um, pretty much everybody beyond the private sector, they've paid for it all. Um, so, for me... This is one of the things that I dislike about the UK. My business rates were extremely high because of these sort of things. Not because we had to cut back on firemen, had to cut back on this. It's pensions. Pensions are where, like the automotive industry in the US, extremely struggling relating to the pensions because they're unsustainable. Taxpayers paying for it means that government sectors is sustainable at the cost of the taxpayer. But anyway, viability has been a problem in the UK. And I'll just cover the business quite quickly. Back in the 90s, a lot of the furniture manufacturers moved to the east. They moved to Estonia, places like that, because the business is still viable. Electricity is cheaper, labour is cheaper, tax and national insurance is cheaper. So they moved the entire companies. And that has been happening a lot. This is the whole realms of outsourcing. When you've got a positive spin on it, it is companies talking as if it's beneficial for the business in the fact that they're not being robbed blind by the state or landlords. Um, reality is the cost is phenomenal in the UK. Now, I work in the UK as and when, um, but I prefer working remotely. Being here in Spain actually saves my finances probably about 
cost me about one third of what it would cost for my cost of living in the UK. I have a lot of extra expenses, especially now that they've changed the tax system because they're squeezing even more money out of people that are self-employed. Um, but before, I've had my own uh, furniture company. You have a lot of legislation, a lot of tax, a lot of red pa paperwork, etc. Red tape. Um, it's simply not worth the hassle. Now, the question is, well, you didn't have enough money to do it in the UK. It's actually incorrect. I already did it in the UK. I had a haulage company in the UK as well. That was successful as well. We, did, we made some good money over the years. But ultimately, I can make the same sort of money in the Philippines or Spain without having to have huge burdens of these people that are sitting on your back. The same friend of mine had a... Um, well, he's still got it. It's an upholstery company. He does things like uh, upholsters, all the seats and bars, pubs, antiques, all that sort of stuff. He's very special, very good. He used to have a factory in Birmingham with, a, I think, he employed somewhere between 100 and 300 people. The, the building next door, um, the Indian guys that had it decided to do an insurance fraud and set fire to the building one night. It burned his building down as well. Now, the insurance assessors would not pay out because the building next door is obviously liable and there's a legal case pending and blah, 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 no money. So he then started the business out of a sprinter van. He had to make it really redundant, etc., and started out of a sprinter van. He then ended up with a unit next to my unit in, um, well, I can't remember where, Lysinton. Um, and he worked his way back up from working out the back of a van to having seven to 10 people. And the difference was, he now made more money with just those 10 people than he did with 100 plus because of all the legislation, etc., etc. The extra payments you have to pay, the high rental fees, etc., etc. So it's not about costing, it's, where it's about common sense. The reality is, you can work less and make more. And sitting here looking out my sunny window is much better than looking out a dreary, rainy UK. So from that point of view, it's the same in the Philippines. Call centre, viable there. The big problem I have right now is upgrading, upgrading people to the right skill sets and trying to get them to stay. Because one of the problems I have is, firstly, a lot of people that did the call center don't want to do anything more than the call center because they, they have a good standard of living and quite happy to do phone bashing all day, but not really happy about learning how to code, do graphics design or something else. They seem very locked in to what they were taught when we started the call center. Although they're all... I mean, I'd say about 80% of them are all like, when's the call centre opening again? Because they all want to come back. Um, but ultimately, it was a case of the Philippines, you can have a bigger business with less money um, and have higher profitability. On top of that, you've also got to look at, it's not just small companies that do it, but things like um, Carillion was doing it even before the collapse. Carillion were doing it years ago. They'd been getting rid of a lot of their landmark properties and large offices. Uh, as the leases, leases expired, they prompted people to work from home. They encouraged it. New contracts made you a home worker. The reason for that is I'm working from home. They don't pay for my electric. They don't pay for my telephone, etc., etc. With a corporate office, you've got IT infrastructure. You've got electricity bills at a premium rate. You've got water, electric, all that. Uh, sorry, water, electric, internet, everything at commercial rates. You've got rent that is phenomenally overpriced. Business rates, excessively overpriced. So an office space becomes very, very expensive to the point when you look at the real figures, you'd be better off giving somebody an extra thousand pounds to sit at home rather than um, have them in your office and that's what they did they started getting rid of the offices and you'll find a lot of companies did exactly the same and still are they don't openly talk about it because it makes it look like the companies are actually in decline when the reality is they're actually trying to keep viable which is why I separate whether you can afford it or viability because you can afford to have an office 
but it's stupid to have it. You know, at the end of the day, unless you're actually bringing customers in there, there is no need to have it. Prime example of that is some of the most expensive uh, property in Canada is where the Quillian office, I'm not sure they're still, I think they're still Quillian in Canada um, because it's a separate business. But they, they have a small sublet in office in one of the most expensive buildings there. But it's only enough space for four desks. And the reason for that is when they have clients and customers, they see the big building and think, well, these, guys, these are the guys, they know what they're doing, they're in the most prestigious building. Um, but then they take them to the conference suites and then they never really come into the office. It's false perception. And that's how a lot of corporations are these days. Nobody really talks about the amount of people they have in India. Nobody really talks about where your data is actually stored. Have you any idea? Um, the reality is a lot of this stuff is around the globe. And this is the point. Around business, that's why we did it. You know, at the end of the day, I can still work and do as and when consult to the UK, but I try and tie everything into the company's liability and not mine. I'm not interested in owning a UK car. I'm not interested in any of the hassles around the UK. Because one of the things I would have, and I can guarantee a corporate would be confused on this, if I take my car to the UK, which is on Spanish plays, they would then be wondering, how do I put this through the accounts? Sounds so stupid, but I've dealt with the customs, HMR, see in Spain and the UK and they do not tally up properly at all they're, they're a real mess um, but the point being is for me all that burden should be on the corporation I am not interested I'm there to make money they've moved a lot of the goalposts as well with HMRC relating to your accommodation costs etc etc so the viability for me is actually dumping all those costs on the corporation that can actually claim them back rather than what the HMRC have tried to do now, which is dump the responsibility of me, I just go, not interested. Um, so that's a prime example. It wasn't the fact I didn't have money and couldn't actually open a business. I've actually had several businesses in the UK and did quite well over the years. But ultimately, we were moving to the Philippines anyway, and quite simply, it was it's viable. I mean, I'll, I'll cover... Um, one of the guys that's actually doing an art business very soon. He's doing quite well at that in the Philippines right now. Um, we've also got some other contracts coming up where I'm just waiting for the documents to come in for that, but I'll we'll talk about that later. But one of the things, I, the fundamental thing about this actual uh, video was the fact is there isn't always a negative in everything. You know, if you seek for one, you'll always find something to complain about, but often the objection or viewpoint is very narrow and you there is no comprehension of the other stuff that actually went on to connect the dots um it's a bit like everybody that goes to the philippines must be an old retired fart that couldn't actually get uh, somebody back in their own country um utter rubbish you know myself i went to the philippines in in my 30s, mid 30s, I think. Um, point B, I wasn't desperate. I wasn't. I wasn't even looking for a relationship. I was quite happy being single. But had I been in a relationship, I'd been in a relationship for 11 years prior to that. And quite simply, I wasn't even looking for somebody new. I was actually looking for a new car and moving apartment into central Birmingham. So the, the point being is, blink of view. It's like. Open your mind to other people. You know, everybody's different. People decide to do things um, because they want to. Myself, I like traveling. I like new experiences. I like new countries. I like new people. I like finding new technologies and stuff and taking an interest in stuff that is new to me. Um, I'm not driven financially that much. Um, I like reducing my costs. Let's be honest. If I make more money and less costs, I like that at the end of the day, because it gives me more flexibility to travel. In the same way, right now, we're in a very good position in Spain. And once these next developments happen, um, things will move forward rather rapidly once they do occur. 
But at the same time, this is our first year of actually having the flexibility to do the things I wanted to do because uh, held up with the immigration process here. Bizarrely, if I had opened a, bil a business here and spent over half a million euros, there would have been no problem at all. It would have been much, much faster. But I'd probably have to write that money off, um, in my personal opinion. It would be locked into Spain forever. Um, not that I have a half a million euros liquid anyway, but the, the point being is I would want to invest half a million euros in a business in Spain. Um, unless I actually knew it 100% because the corruption is terrible here. Um, not on a local scale. Let's be honest. If I'm living here, I do my own thing. Nobody bothers you. But you've just had two politicians, for example, that are now being investigated relating to a university, giving them free degrees. The, <laughs> the second person involved in this actually has already openly said they didn't say I had to attend any seminars, exams or anything else. They just gave it to him. And I assume there's going to be a whole ream of free degrees uh, that are going to come out of this. But the, there is always politicians being in the circulation of prosecution in Spain. It's daily. I mean, it is daily. Literally, you turn the news on, there is always a politician involved with something. For me, that if I bought an office here, which we will do at some point, it will have a function. And even that, I'll probably write it off, unless it was actually leased, um, write it off as a long-term expense write-off. Um, because, quite simply, the corruption is bad. At the same time, I'm not really fast because if I'm investing in something like that, then I've made a lot more money elsewhere. So it's a bit like the Philippines. The buildings we have there will gain value over time. They already are because of the seaside and other things. But ultimately, they're being rented out on a regular basis anyway, so I don't care. It just it generates cash on a regular basis. Um, yeah, I mean, that was another point the same person brought up about the, you maybe you must have not been able to afford a business in the UK when I've had a few. Um, but, yeah, mention about my paying for my in-laws, medical costs, etc. The reason I mention it is the fact is a lot of expats, A, don't have any medical insurance, B, don't have enough savings for medical cover, and C, will get approached by family members and stuff because you may be the last hope for a lot of people. Myself, I built it into my budget. You know, at the end of the day, we look after our own. It's, that's the way we are. So saying it's not classy, I would say it's not classy to not be able to cover your own medical expenses for your wife, your kids, whatever. Um, I would say that's short-term thinking and a bit selfish, but hey ho. Everyone's entitled to their own opinion. But anyway, guys, uh, yeah, I'd say focus on the positive stuff. Um, and be, be aware that YouTube is just this view of me. I, you're not getting my camera 24-7. You're only seeing the stuff that is related to specific topics at a specific time. It's not a case of we're talking about um, this and then you follow me around everywhere. It's, it's not like that. So this is where some people do get a single view on something. Um, you can see it in the comments where they assume this is this or this is that. Yet, yeah, it's it's basically covering a specific topic. Um, it's not covering everything, and it's not always going to be like when people say, "Oh, why are you so negative on the Philippines?" It's not negative on the Philippines. I'm talking about the stuff that are risks, etc. You can't all be. Um, smiles and happiness and Prozac happy. Um, look at Boracay. All those people there, it's fantastic, it's great. Duterte just closed it. Why is he closed it? Because the state is in. How many people are talking about the state is in? Don't know anybody. There's your smiley, happy, everything's great type people. Um, they could have actually been doing something more productive in actually highlighting some of the problems on Boracay. I'm more critical, I'm more clinical, I'm more uh, analytical because I analyze things. That's what I do. I mean, that's fundamentally what I do. I analyze companies. But anyway, 
Thanks for watching.